I'm going to talk about uh, something I've been working on for more than 10 years, uh, where I think there are opportunities for ad hoc networks, uh, control, communication, distributed computing, and so on. It will be a little bit a talk that starts from an application domain, and then we will move into looking into some specific problems in this area. Uh, I, talk, I call this cooperative road freight transport, so it's a problem how we move goods on our road infrastructure. It's something which has been going on in my group for quite some time, and there are many people here who have contributed. Most of the people you see here have been uh, either students or, or postdocs in my group, but there are also some other collaborators, as you see. You also see that Scania, which is a Swedish truck manufacturer, are mentioned here, as you will see throughout the talk. Their experimental work that we have been doing together has been very important for this work. So the problem we are considering here is, an, is a very uh, simple one, if you want, but a very important one. It's how, how we should transport goods in our society. And, uh, I took Germany here as an example, not just because Sweden just kicked them out from the world cup, as you might have heard this morning. I'm sorry for the Germans in the audience. <laughs> but uh, the reason I took it here was actually because the, the graph is quite nice if you want to talk about the road, uh, road transport network. What I'm interested in is what's happening in, in, uh, in the society, namely that we mainly transport goods on the highways across where we have big cities. Why? Because in the big cities, that's where people are living and there where we have the factories, right? And how, what can we say about how we do that today? The characteristic of this problem, what can we say? What size does it have? So in Germany, for instance, there are 400,000 of these long haul trucks that goes across, across cities. In Europe, there is about 2 million similar number in, in, in US, of course, a little bit more in, in, in Asia. What is interesting from a research viewpoint is today it's a, it's a very um, divided type of problem. The logistics, the high level logistics is very much separated from the low level transportation, the driver who is driving the vehicle and so on. Right? So if you want, since I come from a control area, if I want I, I could view it as a large distributed control system, basically that we have, but it's very little real-time coordination happening. You basically would tell the driver you're supposed to go from LA to Chicago and then she drives. That's basically what's going on. Uh, what's more, if you want to think more about the, 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 the economic aspect of this, is that it's not uh, a domain which is dominated by a few big ones. It's dominated by a huge number of small fleet owners. You see in US, for instance, 97% operates quite few number of trucks. So what I will talk about here is how can we make this system more efficient? And efficiency I will look at from two, two angles. One is how can we uh, spend less fuel and how can we make uh, the labor being more efficient? And I'm not just interested in an academic solution here. I'm not interested in solving the traveling salesman's problem or so, I'm interested in something which actually would make sense and that we could implement. And how can I, I so to say, articulate these constraints? Here I say that I, I would like to have limited intervention in what routes and timing and so on these transportations is being done today. So that's what, what we would like to do. So why are we interested in this problem? And we can look at it from the three different angles here. We can start with the societal view. Of course, road transport consumes a lot of energy, it pollutes a lot. It's not only that, it's actually when it looks globally, it's one of these spenders of energy and, and polluting that is going in the wrong direction. It's growing with time. Most other area is being better and better, not road transportation. If we look now on, on, on long haulage goods transport, it's very inefficient. I was quite surprised when I saw these figures the first, uh, the first time. So about one quarter of all long haulage trucks runs empty. And the average load capacity is about 50%. The reason is not just that people who are doing this 
don't know how to do it. There is, of course, a lot of constraints that are part of, of, of the market here. But it might indicate that there is something we can do, so to say, from making these systems more intelligent. If you also want to, to think about where should we in society make investments, there have been some studies looking into uh, that actually good transport is much better to spend uh, our societal resources on than people transport. For, for a certain reason. There is one uh, study done by Andreas Meyer at Cisca who, who did some uh, calculations around this. If we then move down in the food chain and we come to the to the individual, the fleet owner now, what, what is money spent on? This is a life cycle cost that you see in this pie chart. And you see there why I'm interested in spending less fuel and using less labor. Because one third is basically the fuel cost and one third is the driver cost. So if we can make this system more efficient, it means really a lot. So why now, and uh, I, I don't think for this audience I need to spend any time on, on this slide, right? We have the technology now to do this, right? We have real-time traffic information. A modern truck today has all kind of sensing and, and communication capabilities. You have radar, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communication and so on. There's all kind of new type of propulsion being studied. This is an electric highway in Sweden. We might see this type of things and other other type of, of uh, ways of, uh, of, of uh, propelling trucks in the future. Here I'm mainly interested in the automated part of the driving. So thanks to that we can automate the driving, what can we benefit from that? And I will spend quite some time here talking about the tuning as one such uh, component. So let's look at the system that we have, have developed through this little video here. So let's say that we have four cities in Germany and we're interested in transport goods between these cities. And then there might be a segment where the trucks are overlapping part of their, their, their distance there in time and space. So during this time they could of course go together in a road train like this. And as they do that they would then benefit because they might not need to have drivers in, in some of the vehicles and, 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 and so on. If we would know the transport over Europe, then we could then combine them. So this is a system that we have, uh, have developed. So here you see three Scania trucks that are automatically now going in such a platoon. You see drivers sitting in all the vehicles, but they are basically not doing anything in the, in the second and third vehicle uh, because they are automatically uh, driven now. So you automatically we regulate the distance uh, between uh, the trucks like, like this. So of course it's not enough just to being able to regulate the distance between the truck and form this platoon because you also need to, for instance, join a platoon while you are driving on the highway. Like you see here, there is the last truck now coming in and join the other ones. And of course there are many other things that will happen out there on the highway when these trucks are driving, for instance, there will be other vehicles, like this little white car there, that decides now to sneak into that platoon. And what's happening now is that you saw that automatically the, 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 the platoon split up and allow that car to, to be in there and they communicate this to the drivers, and then the human driver that decides to leave the platoon again and then you, you, you close the gap. So there is a number of these things which, which needs also to be you need to be able to handle. And of course, there might be something running out in front of the first vehicle, and when that breaks, then all the other needs to be breaking automatically. So imagine now that we have such systems in place, and what you just saw at Scania, and, and we are not, uh, and KTH are not the only one, basically every truck manufacturer in the world are investing in this. So what you see there now, a lot of, of uh, different players can do this. So what I'm interested in now is to think about when we have such systems, so, so what can we do with that? How can we now change the future of the goods transport? And my future, as you see in this cartoon, looks very similar to what we have today. We will still have trucks on, on, the, on the roads, but in this, in this system here, I see that we have an integrated freight transport system. So on the lowest level, we still have vehicles, and vehicles now going together in this type of platoons. That's the lower level there. But then we need to have cooperation. 
because while these vehicles are driving out on the highway, they need to automatically be able to find out who should I merge with and how should we merge. So there is a cooperation level that needs to be able to interact, of course, with the vehicle, but also upwards. Upwards, what I call here is a fleet layer, would be connecting to the fleet management system. So if you have a Maybe not fine, but if you have 100 trucks going around in the US, you probably have a, a back office like the one you see down to the right, where, where people are monitoring all your trucks and so on. So this now needs also to be interconnected with, with the rest of that system. And perhaps on that level also, we will see, as we will discuss towards the end of this talk, also that fleet layer, the fleet operators might also start cooperating there and there might be a new market for this type of systems in the future. So what I plan to do for, the, for the, this talk here is now to talk a little bit about some solutions that we have come up with and also some open problems going from down to, to, to up there. So down on the level of vehicle platooning, what do we mean by that? What type of systems is involved in that? looking into the formation of platoon, what does that mean, and, and, and so on, and then end up with the coordination on the, on the top level. Okay, so that is what, what's going to happen, so uh, and let's start with the, with the first one. So with vehicle platooning, so you can't go to a, at least not a control conference uh, over the last 25 years without having sessions on how to control a platoon or vehicle. And one of the first papers was this by Bill Levine and Mike Athens uh, 52 years ago, where they come up with this concept that we can think about the platoon of vehicles as a string of masses, and then we could try to control them and, and, and in, in, in a good way. So since then there has, of course, been a lot, a lot of work. Uh, some of the biggest successes was, was here in California, which uh, many of you know about this PATH project and the automated highways system that was going on in the 80s and 90s, where the idea was basically that you can pack more vehicles <coughs> together if you drive them close to each other, and then we can have a more efficient infrastructure to transport cars. Since the 90s, also a lot of things have happened, and what I will talk about here is the, 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 the truck part of this. And we are fortunate in Sweden that we actually have two big truck companies. So we have Volvo on the west coast, Gothenburg, and we have Scania on the east coast. And both of them have been very much involved in this from the very beginning. And we have collaboration with, with, uh, with both of them here. So why are we interested in doing this truck uh, platooning? So this is very different if we go back to what was going on in, in the automated highway system here in California. Because the reason why you want to go together with the, with the trucks here is for, from a simple physical reason. So here you see, I have two trucks and then I plot the air pressure that these trucks feel. Darker color means a higher air pressure. And you see that when the two trucks have quite some distance between, then we have high pressure also on the second vehicle. Why when that second vehicle is moving closer to the first vehicle, the air pressure goes down? So air pressure goes down means, in, in, a, in figure, something like this. Here you see on the x-axis the relative distance between the vehicles. So you see it's 10, 20, 30 meter between the vehicles in the platoon. <coughs> on the y-axis, it's an air drag reduction, 10, 20, 30 percent. So you see that if we now drive something like 10, 20 meters between the vehicles, we have an air drag reduction of 40 percent. It's quite significant air drag reduction, the same thing that you might experience if you are, are a biker. What does this mean for uh, uh, fuel consumption? It means a quite significant reduction in, in fuel. So something like between 5 and 20 percent. I will come back to these numbers, but, but it depends very much about what type of communication, what type of sensory information you have, what type of control you do, and what road conditions and so on you have. So typically, when we have been doing our experiments, it's about 10%. If you have any experience with any automotive company, in particular heavy vehicles, you know that if you can get a fuel reduction of 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0
of something that runs 24-7. They are very interesting. And then, so you can imagine if we talk about figures of 5, 10 percent, this, this is why now, since, since just a few years, everyone is, is investing. Unfortunately, if we should not drive 10, 20 uh, meters uh, between the vehicles, we cannot do that with human drivers, right? So we need to do it automatically. So we need to build basically a system around this which handles, handles the, 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 the control. And, uh, so you basically take over the role of the driver in the second and third but before we come into that, let me dig a little bit deeper into a single vehicle so we understand how that works uh, now. How, how do we regulate the velocity of a single vehicle? So here I have a single vehicle which is going uh, uh, along a highway. As long as we are going on a flat road, the optimal thing is to go on in steady uh, conditions or constant velocity. If we are going, if we suddenly have an uphill here uh, with some uh, road grade as an indicator there, what is the optimal thing to do if I want to minimize my fuel uh, spending here? Either I can reason about this intuitively or I can write out my optimal control problem. And since uh, I took the optimal control class, I write out the cost function. So I write out how much fuel would I spend while I'm drove, driving over that hill, which I say take capital T time to, to, to drive over. And then I write out Newton's equation for the vehicle. And you see here that on the right hand side, I have the engine force that is, is pushing me forward, right? And then I have a number of forces that are pulling me back. I have a potentially braking force. I have the air drag, which is proportional to velocity squared, roughly speaking. And then I have something that depends on the rolling resistance and finally the, the gravity force. And what makes this interesting for a truck now to go over such hill, which is not interesting for a car, is that the gravity force now will take over from the air drag. And that's why, of course, that when we are driving behind a big truck and it's going uphill, it will be slow down, right? So if we solve this optimal control problem, we will get trajectories something like this. So on the top of the diagram there, you see how the, how the altitude is going up and then going down. If we have a light truck, the blue one, we should just keep constant velocity. If we now have a heavier truck, which is not able to keep constant velocity, the optimal thing is to do like you see the red dashed line there. We should first speed up before the hill, and then we should allow ourselves to go down again. And vice versa, when we go down. So it's very uh, intuitive, right? It's something similar that you might do when you're biking. And uh, actually, uh, truck drivers know about this. They, they are doing this. Uh, this talk, when you drive behind someone next time, you will notice if they do. Typically, they get a, a bonus if they drive fuel efficiently. In Europe, it's typically 20%. So they know how to optimize. There is a problem if you try to implement this scheme I, I, I have here. What's the problem? There is a piece of information that they assume here is available, which you don't have available, I, I don't think, in your car. Yes, great, good. You get the, you get the star. It's the, the alpha here. It's not, it's not available. You can buy that, you can buy it from different companies that travel around the, the road infrastructure and measure this. It's, it's quite expensive. We, we were involved in a European project where we bought this information. If you, if you have a number of trucks, you can do something different. You can do what we did actually quite some years ago in, in another in a PhD project. So for instance, if you have a number of trucks traveling around some segment of Europe here, right? You can run a distributed estimation algorithm, which you see depicted up in the right. They're basically an extended Kalman filter taking information into account of vehicles that are traveling around, and you will learn this road grade as you are traveling across. But anyhow, for, for this talk, we will assume that we now have that road grade available. Okay, so how does it now work if you now take that, uh, that information into account and you want to regulate now the velocity in, in such a way? 
What does it look like? What is the architecture inside the vehicle? What you see here is from the left, the sensor information coming in. Then you see the CAN bus where we have uh, where information now goes to the control controllers there, central, the, 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 the uh, uh, cruise controllers. And then on the right you see the actuator. So the actuator for this system is the energy management system. So that's basically where you send the reference velocity. Then you have the braking management system, you regulate the braking, the brakes. And you have the gear management system, because you also need to regulate the gear. The gearbox of a truck have maybe 20, 25 gears. You need to regulate them as well. And why I put this slide up is just I want to indicate now that if you have a standard cruise controller where you just keep a constant speed, or if you have something more advanced, it's just a different piece of code that sits at this point. And the driver still is in, in power to switch. Now we're decided that we are not going to cruise control or someone. So what I talk about here, now when we will start talking about the tuning where we use a collaborative adaptive cruise controller CACC, it's something which somehow comes from free if you just say that the software is free. It's not any differences in what you're in. Okay, that's inside one vehicle, and when we now go together many vehicles, it's not uh, uh, much different than this, right? So, so multiple vehicles now, if they are running in this uh, platoon mode, they will then communicate either implicitly via the radar that the vehicle has in front, or over some wireless communication. What I talk about here is either a Wi-Fi network, 802.11p, which is typically used, but I will also talk a little bit about cellular network, how you can use that also for this, this regulation. So the regulation here is mainly now to regulate the distance between the beams. We want them to be close, but not closer than they are still set. So that is the problem I mentioned in the beginning that uh, Athens and Levin was, was studying and studying for a long time. We want that solution of how to control that to be distributed. We don't want to have a global coordination because that wouldn't, wouldn't be working right since we need to have tight control there. So the question is how can we do this? And this has been studied for, for a long time and one important concept that has been introduced is something called string stability which basically means that if we have a number of vehicles in a platoon indicated by different curves there, it could be so that even if we have a small disturbance, small error between the first two vehicles indicated by this little bump there, that disturbance can grow as we go down the platoon if we are not careful. And this we have to avoid and one can study that uh, by different type of, of means. There are many research groups that I won't now talk about really this control algorithm. I will instead show some experiments. So uh, a few years ago, we developed our own distributed control algorithm, uh, following somehow the trends over the last 50 years. And then we wanted to test that. So where we went uh, west of Stockholm, so we are up there in northern Europe, and we had a stretch of, of a, a highway there going. Uh, to another city called Eskilstuna, about 45 kilometers. Yes? So what kind of uh, topol communication topology do you have? Is it a line network? With the first one talking to the second, second, the third, etc.? Yes, yes. In this case, it is. It is yeah. And I also, it's only local communication. The second one, in this experiment, the second one is not communicated. The third one, or the first one, communicated. <laughs> Okay, so, so here you see that this, this, is not, uh, this is not completely flat road, it's a little bit a hilly road, but nothing extreme, it's a, it's a, it's a highway. And um, we went back and forth over um, a couple of weeks with, under different conditions and so on with three vehicles and so on. The platoon. Here I just show one set of experiments, you see it's over a few kilometers. And I, I plot uh, something here. Uh, so on the top plot there, you have the altitude again. So you see there is a hill going up and down and up and down, like that, right? The second plot shows the, uh, the speed of the vehicle. 
And now the blue one is the first vehicle, and the red one is the, the second vehicle. The third plot is the distance between the vehicles. Then we have the torque from the first and the, the second vehicle, and we have the braking signal from the, the, the second vehicle. Wow. That was not good. of the second vehicle at the second downhill there, you see that the, uh, the second vehicle's velocity, the red curve starts to oscillate. The first one, the blue one, of course, increases. We're going downhill and, and it's a heavy crash. It will increase velocity. But the second one, the velocity oscillates, which means that the distance to the, to the vehicle ahead there, the distance between the first and second vehicle also varies like this. You see that the torque generated by the second vehicle is also making these uh, oscillations, like you see here. And what is really bad now, from a fuel efficient viewpoint, is this, right? We are braking three times and we want to save fuel, so the worst thing we can do is to brake because that's a waste. It's, we are burning up energy. So this is, this is bad. So when we, when we saw this thing, we, we start to think for ourselves. So, so is it something which is just a tuning here, or is it something with the communication topology or, or these things, or is it something more, more fundamental that might be, be a problem here? And one thing we, we started to think about was what does the topography variation, what role does that play? A lot of experiments have been done, for instance, in Nevada or, or places where it's not as hilly as, as, uh, as hilly in Sweden. So uh, we were thinking about that, and also, should we regulate the distance between the vehicle, or should we regulate on something else? And um, let me show you uh, a little cartoon here to see how we reason about this, how, about this problem. So let's say that we have a single vehicle that goes on a flat road and then comes an uphill like that. 
Uh, we will never know exactly where that up will start, right? We will know that with some uncertainty. So what will happen, even if we try to keep a constant velocity of that vehicle, there will be a little disturbance. So the velocity is first constant, and then it will be a disturbance. The velocity goes down, and then it comes back up again, right? Because we don't know exactly where it is. And that uh, velocity now, we can look at that disturbance over time, as to the left there, or over space, as I do to the right. Right? It's the same, it's the same thing. What happens now if I put the platoon there, and I assume now that all the vehicles can perfectly regulate the distance to the vehicle ahead. Right? So there is a perfect controller in every of these vehicles. What will happen then? So when the velocity now goes down for the first vehicle, all the other vehicles will reduce their velocity instantaneously. So that disturbance will happen instantaneously at the same time in all the vehicles. If I now plot that over space instead along the road, that happens, of course, at different point in space for the other vehicles. So if you now take this this, this cartoon now, and you simulate it in your head a little bit forward, right? What is happening next? Next, the second vehicle is now going to move a little bit more further and will hit the same disturbance. And then the third vehicle will, will experience the same thing. So we have a type of a system which could experience this over and over again. And this causes some, some problem. So can we do that? Can we, so to say, think about that a little bit different? So instead of regulating the distances, as I indicated with this equation up there, could we do something different? We could, for instance, regulate on the headway, and then we would get a different expression. But we can also regulate on a time gap. So I try now to keep a constant time gap, delta t, here. And if I, re if I put this absolutely right, so to say, if I'm able to regulate that delta t to the right amount, I could even get it so that I get completely the opposite picture than, than previously. So I get the disturbance happening at the same point in space for all the, the vehicles. So this idea we have now developed some, some uh, control theory around, which I won't bore you with here. I will just give you the, 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 the big so say the big picture here, what is happening. So one can reason about that and say that if we are now regulating on a, on, on, a, on a time gap there, delta t, that is equivalent to say that all the vehicles should have the same velocity at the same point in space s. So the vehicle i should have the same velocity as the vehicle in front of it, i minus 1, where it is at the same point. So what consequence does that have? It means that the control problem could now be solved in two different layers. One layer is to say that every vehicle, I, should have the same reference uh, velocity. If we look at that over space instead of over time. That's what the first thing is saying. And then the second objective would be to regulate the time gap. So if we draw a, a, a diagram, we can say that we separate now, so we have a low-level vehicle controller, which tries to now keep that time gap, but also keep that reference. And that reference is the same for, for everybody. And what we can do now is that we can, we can regulate on the low level on different, uh, different things. And one thing that we introduced was a uh, a time error which includes the time gap between the vehicle and how well we are able to keep as close to the, to the velocity error. But as I said, I mean there is a, a whole stability theory that we developed around, around this. I will just show you the, the consequences of the design based on this, on this idea and what it means for the architecture because I think that is the most interesting thing. This is basically the same system as you saw previously, but if you start look down left first on the architecture, it looks much more complicated now. So what has happened from what you saw previously? Number one, I assume now that I have the road grade information available, the alpha. I have that from some road database. That goes into a block I call a platoon coordinator. That's a new guy I introduced. That block 
is now computing the reference velocity, I call it now Vs star, to every vehicle. Every vehicle gets the same reference velocity. And then we basically have the same type of safety controller in each So what happens now is what you see here. So you see now that we have a reference velocity there, the green line it looks like, which is changing over time. It's not trying to keep it constant, it's changing. And all the vehicles are now able to, to follow that. The distance between the vehicles are also changing over time. But we are all the time keeping uh, us away from the safety, uh, uh, from the safety margin that, that we have. Question. Yes. So uh, the platoon coordinator is, I guess, uh, uh, that, uh, away from this, you know, the wi a wireless network or some other mechanism to communicate this to. Uh, uh, and so what kind of delays and what kind of error rates do you expect? Do you need to? Uh, yes. So, so, so in this, uh, I should say also, but, but before I answer your question, that that this now is a hi-fi simulation. It is not the, the same experiments, but it will be very detailed. It's basically 1,000 state uh, hour train models of the vehicles and so on. So they are supposed to be, to be fairly good. So the low-level controllers run on the level of 10, 20 milliseconds. The platoon coordinator can run much slower because it's only the how we need to change now the reference velocity. So you can think about running that maybe over 10 seconds or, or, or so. so. We have been, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not so critical, but your, your question is perfect because this is what, what I want to go next now. And that is, so where should that platoon coordinator be resided? Where should that block be, right? So you can think about that, that maybe it should be in the first vehicle, maybe it should be in, in the second vehicle or in all vehicle, I should say. Or it could be outside. And that's something we are investigating now. So you can imagine that you have the platoon coordinating residing, for instance, if you want, in the cellular network. There could be a coordinator that now trying to optimize the platoon and which is traveling with the platoon. And if we now are doing this, this opens up a number of interesting research problems, which does not only have to do with the uh, with the platooning, of course, it can, can do with many things that we would like to control over a 5G infrastructure. So we have a, a project now with Ericsson where we are looking into this. And one thing that you, you, you come into immediately is that if you now do this thing over the cellular infrastructure, you have problems with handover. Because handover today is not synchronized. If you and me sit in the same vehicle and we are traveling together, my phone might make a handover after yours at the right? While if you have a platoon moving together, we would like that handover to be synchronized over multiple entities because they are part of the same control system. So you can think about it in an abstract notion like you have a number of control loops moving along the terrain, so to say, and that you now want to make sure that this handover is going on in a synchronized way. That's one, one thing. But relating perhaps more to your question is also where, how far could we go from the base station? So the thing is that when, when you just go to the base station and back again, that is basically as far as going over a Wi-Fi or so. That's our experience because you know, the delay is not, it's not larger. But then you can ask yourself, should you do the computation in the base station? Should you do it, so to say, in some sort of edge cloud close to the base station? Or can you do it even further away, or, or how, how should it be done? And that is not uh, completely clear, clear yet, but we are very interested in trying to push it. Push it. Okay, that was basically what I was wanted to say on the, on the low level. Don't worry, the, the two and three here will not be as long as the, as the, the first one. So let's uh, move up a little bit. I said that it's not enough just to go in a platoon, we need to be able to, to, to uh, form a platoon and split the platoon and so on. And the forming and splitting is nothing, uh, it, it's very straightforward, right? You imagine that you have a number of vehicles coming in from different uh, regions. Sorry for that. Uh, so they're coming in from different regions. Let me, uh, my, my workers, uh, 14, I go. 
they, they come in from different regions, and then they need to synchronize, so they meet at that point, right, on the highway, and then they go together for a while, and then they have maybe different destinations, and they need to... Okay, so what I, I, I was just talking about was saying that, you know, this merchant split is just what you expect it to be. What is make it interesting is that now this is a regulation problem that we have over basically the cellular network, right? Because what I'm talking about is that we want to suggest now reference velocity to, for instance, that platoon to the left and that uh, vehicle to the right so that they merge in a nice, in a nice way. But it's more or less the same concept as you see previously. The difference is that when we are closing the loop now, we need basically to have information also about the traffic around and, and, and other type of, uh, of things available. So instead of going in again on, on the details of that, let me show you some experiments that we have done. So we run 600 tests over a, a short stretch on the highway south of Stockholm, back and forth, back and forth over three weeks a few years back, and what you see now in these movies, we are sitting in the second vehicle, the second truck that tries to form a platoon with the truck in front of us. That's the only thing that's happening, we are doing this over and over again, and why we are interested in this is what you see here, so both these videos are in, in quite busy, maybe not busy in, in an LA term, but in a, in a Swedish term, the, the second video at least, there is some traffic around, right? So what we want to understand is how does traffic influence us when we are forming this platoon. If it looks like in the second picture, the second video there, of course we will never form a platoon, it's too much traffic. But how do we understand the influence of the traffic? And how do we get, what type of information do we get? So while we are traveling here, you see that we are passing a number of gateways, like the one I have on the picture here. So we're basically measuring the density and flow in all three lanes independently. So we get that information in real time out of this system. So out of this here, we can get a lot of traffic information. So we can get, for instance, what is called the fundamental diagram in traffic theory. What, what do I have up on the left here? I have the traffic density on the x-axis, and I have the traffic flow, so the velocity basically, on the, on the y-axis. And what you can see here, is that we have what is well known, we have a typically linear regime when we are in this green, yellow or, or red area. But then if the amount of, of vehicle increases more and more, we are all over this diagram and nothing really interesting can be, be said. But of course if we are in this regime there, which we are most of the time, we can then predict what is going to happen. For instance, we can predict when are we going to to merge. How long time does this uh, take us to merge and when can we predict to have that this merger is happening? Something else that happens here is uh, what you see in this video. There is Sometimes there is like this little red car. You see now we want to merge with the vehicle in front of us. Most of the car traffic is going faster in Sweden here. They would go 110 or 120 kilometers per hour. Trucks go 85. But still there is a red car there that doesn't want to pass. So this is an interesting, we call it a persistent driver phenomenon. It happens now and then. It happens sufficiently often that you, you would bother about it. And you would think about what would, how would you deal with this in a practical situation when you're forming this this type of platoons, should you have some signaling or should you do it in different ways. And I think it's one of these instances that shows that uh, if you want cyber-physical human systems now, the human part plays sometimes a role and we might want to, to understand that a little bit better. Another interesting thing that we, we are studying with has to do with the traffic is imagine that we have a massive amount of track platooning or automated vehicles. How would that influence the highway traffic? So what are the consequences of, 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 of that? So, uh, and one thing one can study is then the congestion problem, right? I mean, so if we now have, like in this cartoon there, we have a number of 
red platoons and then we have some pars. If we now can regulate the platoons as we can here, right? And we can set the velocity of them. Can we improve the condition for the rest of the traffic? And the answer is yes. And for, for us who have studied some uh, filtering or electrical engineering, we know that, uh, that basically if we insert something which now is a little bit heavier in the system, it's like a low pass filter, right? So we are able to filter now the rest of the, of the traffic. And we can study that with different mathematical models. But basically, everything in this very simplified type of models shows that it's better the more platoons you have, you, you will, uh, so to say, be better to handle congestions. Or, of course, if you pack the, the, the platoons tighter together, it's also. So, in this, what kind of uh, traffic models do you consider? Yeah, so in this particular work, we actually develop our own uh, traffic model, or it's a very simple fluid queuing model that we did. But, but we compare this, so, so this type of result we have there, we have also compared with the self-transmission model, the CTM model, which is uh, the classical one that's you know, used. The problem with the CTM model, or if you take one of the PE model, that mathematically to be able to get something, some close look, you know, expression out of that or getting some control algorithm out is very hard. Here, this is just a very initial part of the story. It's just to have such a model so we can actually do stability theory. We can understand it. We can stabilize, for instance, if we have a standing wave or something like that in our car traffic. Can we stabilize that with this type? Therefore, we do this very simple type of model. Yeah. Some more questions? Uh, what happens when a platoon gets broken up, like at traffic lights? No, that, that, okay, that, that's, that's a good point. I should have said that perhaps in the beginning. Everything I talk about here is highway. So we are talking about situations we have seen in the, in the movies. We are also doing work when you are doing platooning of, of trucks or buses downtown. But that's a separate story. You do this for different reasons, so it's, it's quite uh, Quite different form and in order to help the traffic is it advisable that you restrict the size of the platoon yes yes absolutely so so here it's, it's not a coincidence that you typically see free uh, trucks or something like that so so we, we work under the assumption that maybe you will see three four or five or so but not ten or twenty or so not from practical reasons a lot of things that otherwise would be troublesome for those of you who drive in northern Italy uh, now and then, you know the problem if you have tattoos of 100 trucks. Yes. Yes. What is the priority in the map? Sorry. Priority of the regular vehicles or what? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is. Priority? Yeah. This, sorry for just throwing this up so, so quickly. Now, so this is a very very simple model. So we just say that we have uh, we have cars that are just going. Uh, with an average distance, which is just moving, moving uh, like this into a queue. It's like a, a queue where we, we have a service, car. right? And then we have a track that is also coming into the same queue, right? And that track are coming together in this right. pipeline. So in the queue now, you need to do some normalization. So you see that you, you kind of, when you reason about the congestion here, you have to, so to say, get the, 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 the big track take up, so to say, the right size compared to the small size. Oh, you mean the priority? Oh, I see. Priority. Ah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So what, what do we mean? Yeah, so one thing we investigate here was something which uh, has been discussed, at least in Europe a bit. So should we have, like you see up there to the left, you can imagine that that left lane would be like a diamond lane here. Have a prioritized lane for platooning trucks, or we could say that that lane uh, we don't have such lanes. So trucks or platooning trucks go anywhere, and the cars will go anywhere. And, and so it's a little bit similar to understanding: is there a benefit of have diamond lanes or not? So is there a benefit to have lanes for automated vehicles and perhaps for automated trucks? Of course, they will not be static; they will be dynamic. So they will, so to say, be Used for trucks at the time of the day. But what is the consequence for the rest of the traffic? That, that is the, the, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, 
you mentioned it, I didn't fully understand it. There is a service like Waze, Citizen Science, or other trucks that collect information about uh, slopes and road condition. And uh, sorry, I so uh, other trucks collect information, you know, yes. citizen science, like ways where data from previous trucks that were driving in the same place. Yeah, um, the elevation. Oh, you mean for getting the road right? No, no, so that thing we did within, so, so if, um, together with this company, Scania. So, Scania, like many other, uh, I would say, automotive uh, manufacturers today, they keep track of their vehicles. For trucks, they even keep track in the sense of that they, they know where they are. So as an owner, if you buy a truck, you subscribe to a service, which they typically call some sort of predictive maintenance service. What you basically give up then is data about where you are and how you are using the truck. Which means that they know where maybe 100,000 trucks or so are traveling all over the world. And this goes into a big database, and that is the type of, of information that we utilize there. So into this database, there is something like maybe 100 data points that are coming in. I mean, information like who is driving and so on, but also the velocity and the position and so on. It's not real time, but it's maybe on five, 10 minute basis. Or so but so. not if it starts giving a slope. No, the slope you don't get, you, you, you see, as you know, the, the, the world is flat, right? So you don't get the slope from the GPS. So what, what we did up, up there was that you, we, we develop an extended car map that is based on a model of the truck. So you need to have a model of, it takes into account how the mass of the truck, some, something of the powertrain and so on. But if you have that information and you are traveling the slope a couple of times, you can now filter out the, the, that okay, thanks for, for, for all the questions. So let's just do the last uh, piece now a little bit, what, what's happening on the, on the top level. And uh, so how do we do the matchmaking? So, and I will just give you one example of how we have been thinking about that. So let's say that we are over a big region, and, and here I sorted out four trucks, so they are going from the source to the destination in this way. Of course, what we can do now is if they are sharing some, some point there in, in, in space, we can think about will they also share it in time? And if they are not sharing it perfectly in time, we can adjust the timing. And that's what we do. So we can adjust the timing by just changing the velocity so little so that the driver don't notice it. That's, that's the idea here. And then you would maximize the amount of of platooning as you do here. So notice that with this matchmaking here, this problem is not a routing problem. We don't suggest different routes. It's a scheduling problem. We suggest the timing of when this thing should happen. And we have done implementation around this across uh, Europe from Stockholm down to, to Barcelona a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, let, let, let's, let's keep this and, and wrap up because I know I'm running, I'm running a little bit late here. So what you have seen here is basically something which is built on top of the three big trends that we see, right? On automated vehicle system, intelligent transport systems, and connected vehicle systems. So we, are, we are in the middle here, and I talked about some snapshots of putting different technology together to make this system a little bit more intelligent. And I focus on three things here in this type of layered system. So we talked about how to make, very quickly now in the end, how to make this uh, matchmaking. We talked also about how to use the communication infrastructure to do this platooning better, and, and how it can be implemented in the, in the, in the cruise controller. Uh, there is a lot of uh, ongoing studies. I didn't know I would get all these questions. Otherwise, I prepared three questions for myself here in the end. <laughs> But just to give you three, three things that we are very excited about now. One is the pricing of this. So how should the economic model look like? You can, you can think about on a low level. Should we pay the driver who is driving first? Or how should this work? But you can also think about it a little bit bigger, right? Should there be some sort of a service? And should that service be owned by Google or Amazon or by authorities or by 
by track manufacturers and so on is not clear and, and it's interesting to do some studies about that. Another thing that we haven't really touched upon but I think is very interesting for this community is the fair sharing of data. With Uber we give up our data, right? We tell where we want to go. It will never work the same way for, for this type of system because a fleet owner don't want to tell other fleet owners where it trucks, uh, where its trucks are going because that's the business data, right? Then you tell basically where your customers are and your competitor will call and, and, and give a better bid. So that wouldn't work. So the question here, one that we have answered is can we do this matchmaking with private data? And one can do that under some privacy restrictions. But there are a lot of other such problems that are hidden here in what I talk about. And then also this with the human in the loop. What about, you know, um, the, the, the driver taking over in certain scenarios or like what I talked about there, having other vehicles and so on. Is this only something going on in Sweden? Uh, no, it's not. It's going on uh, all over, I would say. There is a lot of activity also here in, in, in the US. One of the, probably the biggest, experiment, uh, the biggest project in the world is something we have started now called Ensemble, which is called Multi-Brand Platooning. It's a European project. Multi-brand is that you, you are now platooning with different brands in one platoon. So a lot of truck manufacturers have been doing this, but no one really did platooning with their competitors, right? And we are involved in this pro uh, project, and it's very uh, interesting to, to hear, because you, you don't want to give up information about your engine and drive train and all these things, but what do you want to give up if you now should interact with the others? And of course, there is uh, papers and so on if you're interested. Thanks a lot for your attention.